Hello, I'm Jonathan Winston. I'm a nephrologist, and I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Judith Goldfinger, a cardiologist, and welcome to this edition of National Kidney Foundation Kidney Talks. Today, we're going to address chronic kidney disease, cardioprotective agents, and hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia poses significant risk for patients, both in cardiology and nephrology. We'll discuss it from our respective viewpoints. Mm -hmm. We'll also explore how management of hyperkalemia, our management, may diverge or intersect. As a background, renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors, RAS, decrease mortality and morbidity from congestive heart failure and slow the progression of proteinuric chronic kidney disease. Hyperkalemia is a complication of these agents. Hyperkalemia increases the risk of death. So clearly, their use, the use of RAS agents is mm -hmm. limited in patients at risk for hyperkalemia, namely those with chronic kidney disease, particularly diabetic chronic kidney disease. Current therapeutic paradigms for hyperkalemia emphasize intermittent interventions or elimination of exacerbating factors. Proactive treatment strategies to prevent de the development of hyperkalemia could benefit patients by enabling more liberal use of RAS inhibitors. So Judith, as, you're, as an expert in cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. how do these agents work, and when should we be using them in our patients with heart disease? So from a cardiac perspective, ACE inhibitors are recommended for patients in at least five broad categories. So first and foremost, are patients with heart failure or low ejection fraction. So the normal pumping function of the heart is about 60%. For these patients, the ejection fraction or pumping function is 35 or 40 percent or less depending on the study that you're looking at. So it doesn't matter if the cause of the weak heart was a heart attack or something else. It doesn't matter if the patients have symptoms of congestive heart failure like shortness of breath or leg swelling. Regardless, in large trials with thousands of patients, use of ACE inhibitors in patients with low ejection fractions lowered the rates of death and hospitalizations and also improved heart failure symptoms. So based on this strong evidence, the recommendation to use ACE inhibitors in these patients is class one, so the highest class, level of evidence A, the highest level. And one of the reasons that these drugs are so effective is they help the heart remodel. So we call it reverse remodeling, which means they, it helps the heart reshape itself in a healthy way to correct the changes that happen after an insult like a heart attack. Um, the second group of patients for whom ACE inhibitors are recommended are patients with a recent or even a remote heart attack, whether the heart is weak, whether it pumps normally. And this recommendation for patients who've had a heart attack is also class one, also level of evidence A, so really the strongest evidence that we have. Um, and after a heart attack, starting ACE inhibitors lowers the risk of death or of having another heart attack. And then the next three categories are really, first, ACE inhibitors are recommended for people considered at risk for heart failure because they have diabetes or hypertension. The next category is people with congestive heart failure who recovered. And then finally, people who have hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy. So the benefits of ACE inhibitors are in how they help reshape the heart in this healthy, beneficial way. And we should also mention that for many of these patients, if they can't tolerate an ACE inhibitor, either because of cough or a more serious complication like angioedema, they can take angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, ARBs. Um, the heart failure guidelines recommend caution in using ACE inhibitors, or ARBs, in patients who have a creatinine above 3 milligrams per deciliter or whose baseline potassium is greater than 5.5 milliequivalents per liter. They also recommend starting at a low dose, titrating up, and checking both the renal function and serum potassium within one to two weeks after starting the medication, and then they say periodically after that without giving a specific interval. We also mentioned aldosterone antagonists, which are also called potassium-sparing diuretics. So we consider ACE inhibitors and beta blockers the backbone of heart failure therapy. And then aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone or eplerinone are added for patients who have severe symptoms. So that means symptoms at rest or symptoms at really low levels of exertion, like walking two blocks, less than two blocks. In a large trial, the addition of an aldosterone antagonist on top of ACE inhibitor therapy in these very sick patients decreased death, hospitalization, and improved their symptoms. But in all of the studies, serum potassium and renal function were both followed very closely. Because aldosterone antagonists can dangerously increase potassium levels, 
They have to be avoided when the GFR is less than 30, when the baseline potassium is above 5. They shouldn't be combined with higher doses of ACE inhibitors or with NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen or with potassium supplements. Potassium and renal function should be checked after three days and at one week after starting therapy and then at least monthly for the first three months. So we've addressed how to prevent hyperkalemia. Judith, as a cardiologist mm -hmm. in your day-to-day -day practice, what are your approaches to it? So the reason that we worry about hyperkalemia is because of the risk of arrhythmias or dangerous rhythms of the heart, some of which can be life-threatening. Um, so potassium that's either too low or too high can affect the electrical conduction of the heart. So we will usually say that you can start to see EKG changes with moderate hyperkalemia, so potassium that's 6 or above 6, and that the EKG will become progressively more abnormal as the potassium level rises. But you have to recognize that these are only estimates, as you know. You can see EKG changes at a lower potassium level. You can see a really high potassium with a normal EKG. Um, and so you have to kind of put it all in the clinical context. With moderate hyperkalemia, classically what you see are peak T waves on the EKG. And what that means is that the ventricles are not recovering normally. And a question that I know you get and that we get all the time is, if you see peak T waves and it's just in one lead, is that meaningful? And the answer is probably no. What you expect to see are diffuse peak T waves throughout the EKG. And then that tells you that, that there's a conduction problem throughout. So as the potassium increases above six, so now you're getting to seven or above, you start to see changes that reflect abnormal slow electrical activity in the atria, and then you lose the, the electrical activity in the atria. And after that, and you can see this on the EKG, you will see slow abnormal conduction through the ventricles. So what you see here, for example, is you don't have a P wave anymore, so you're not seeing the electrical activity in the atria, and you see a wide QRS, so conduction through the ventricles is slow. And as this happens and progresses, the heart muscle can't contract and can't pump normally. The most feared development is when you have totally disorganized conduction. So you can see that in this EKG. And this comes right before either asystole, flatlining, or ventricular fibrillation. So what you see here is a sine wave, totally disorganized conduction through the heart. And as it progresses, you would need a defibrillator to treat it. At the stage where you see a sine wave, like here, cardiac arrest is imminent. Thanks, Judith. That was just incredibly informative. So in your day-to-day -day practice, mm -hmm. can you really describe how you approach hyperkalemia mm -hmm. or even hypokalemia, which I assume is also common in your practice, and what are the guidelines that you use and the treatment decisions you make? Sure. So potassium management can be difficult with heart failure patients. And what's funny is we often worry that the potassium is too low because so many of our heart failure patients are taking diuretics. They're usually on supplemental potassium to keep their serum, serum potassium above four to reduce the risk of arrhythmias from hypokalemia. Um, so when I see an elevated potassium result but the renal function hasn't changed, I'll usually repeat the test or check a plasma potassium to make sure that it's accurate. Because the plasma potassium is stable at room temperature or in the refrigerator for several days, you don't have to worry about a delay in processing the sample or that it was hemolyzed. Um, if both the potassium and renal function have worsened though, then we usually expect that the result is real. So with hyperkalemia, I will always ask about a high potassium diet, but the culprit is usually medications, especially in our heart failure patients. And the usual suspects are the medications that affect the RAS system, like you mentioned. So the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and then the aldosterone antagonists, like spironolactone and aplerinone. So, you know, I always say, fortunately and unfortunately, the drugs that cause hyperkalemia are some of the best drugs that we have for heart failure. So in your patients with chronic hyperkalemia, how do you address the hyperkalemia and how do you manage them? Uh, great question and very challenging. Uh, as all the nephrologists in the audience know, hyperkalemia is just part of our practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it in virtually all of our patients. It clearly increases in frequency as GFR falls and it's particularly common in diabetic kidney disease. And of course, all of these are the patients that right. we <laughs> most want to use RAS inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And it's very common for us to see patients and they say, well, Dr. So-and-so stopped the medicine right. <laughs> and they're worried about the potassium and we can't help but feel that there has to be a way to facilitate the use of these agents and to treat hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So this might be a good time to go over the list mm -hmm. of what nephrologists and cardiologists can do to lower serum potassium on a chronic basis mm -hmm. and facilitate the use of these really life-saving uh, agents. Mm -hmm. The actual approach to hyperkalemia was reviewed in the New, New England Journal of Medicine by Biff Palmer. That's uh, the first slide that you're seeing. And it basically tells us that we should be really addressing GFR. Mm -hmm. So we measure serum creatinine and we use one of the GFR estimating equations to know A, where our patient is at in terms of kidney function and whether there's been a change in kidney function. We look at medication, which you mm -hmm. spoke about, uh, drugs that we know increase serum potassium, particularly non-steroidals. We uh, try to uh, prescribe a low potassium diet. If metabolic acidosis is prominent, uh, sodium bicarbonate mm -hmm. is uh, indicated. And most useful to me, and I think to most nephrologists, is try to facilitate potassium excretion through the urine by increasing urine output either with the thiazide diuretics or when GFR falls below 30, a loop diuretic. Finally, we have resins and that bind potassium in the gut and they are not officially labeled for chronic hyperkalemia and there's some controversy about their use, but many nephrologists, myself included, mm -hmm. will use every other day or twice a week resin to manage hyperkalemia. I try to do almost anything reasonable <laughs> to facilitate the use of important cardioprotective agents. So clearly the treatment of hyperkalemia is an important issue. I would like to ask you a question about what really happens in your daily practice. If your practice is like mine, you're seeing a patient, you make a clinical assessment, and part of that is drawing lab tests, but you send the patient home. Mm -hmm. And you might get the lab test back later that day or the next day. Right. So what is the level of potassium that actually trips you into action where you call that patient back, you either discuss issues on mm -hmm. the phone or you send them to the emergency room. How do you handle it? Okay, so the first thing that I have to say is, in general, I defer to the nephrologists on this, and I know that the nephrology community is a lot more comfortable with higher levels of potassium than the cardiology community, which you know. If I see a level of 5.5, I would react to that. And always within the clinical context, what medications is the patient taking? What did the patient look like that day? What were they complaining about? What happened to the renal function? But kind of putting that all together, if I see a 5.5, a next step has to be taken to try to lower that, whether with a diuretic so that they lose potassium in the urine or with a resin so that they lose potassium in the stool. And at the same time, making a change in medications, acknowledging that with the medications that they're on, usually an ACE inhibitor, that their potassium can climb to an even higher level. To go back to your question, if I see a potassium level of six, to me that means the patient has to go into the emergency room. I don't feel comfortable treating a potassium of six on an outpatient basis, even if the patient looks great. And part of the reason for that is I want them to be on a cardiac monitor so that we can see what the rhythm looks like and make sure that as the potassium level is lowered, it's being lowered safely. Um, I guess I'm sending it back to you to hear kind of what cutoffs you would use because I have a feeling that they're probably not the same. <laughs> That's right. Hyperkalemia is very common in my clinical mm -hmm. practice and every nephrologist's clinical practice. So I believe that we have a higher tolerance for potassiums between 5.5 and 6. Uh, but it's possible, if not likely, that we could learn a lot from what you said because as you know, patients with advanced kidney disease are, have a very high mortality, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is based on sudden death. Right. So it may be that as a community, we're too cavalier about hyperkalemia. That being said, I usually act at a potassium of six or higher, mm -hmm. and I make sure that the patient is on a proper regimen. Between 5.5 and 6, I be, myself and I believe a lot of nephrologists mm -hmm. have a higher tolerance for that. If you see six, would you automatically send the patient to the ER or you might still manage them as an outpatient? I would probably manage it as an outpatient, depending on the patient. If mm -hmm. the patient has been chronically hyperkalemic and there's potassiums between 5.8, 5.5, and then I see a six, I don't think I'd be as uh, concerned mm -hmm. as I would if someone had normal potassium and then it jumped quickly.
uh, but I would definitely make sure the patient is on a resin mm -hmm. or some other approach to remove potassium from the body. At what cutoff would you get an EKG? Because we always say at six you need an EKG, and I think for some it might even be 5.8. You know, when you start seeing the high potassiums, you would want the patient to have an EKG before you'd feel comfortable. I think it really does def depend on the patient. Mm -hmm. I think 6.5 or higher, I have no tolerance. So mm -hmm. then that patient comes back to the office or to the emergency room. But I think between 6 and 6.5, I tend to be a little more liberal. Casual. <laughs> <laughs> Casual or liberal. Okay. And then do you have a definite cutoff of when you would want them admitted, or is that 6.5 or still, depending on what the patient looks like? Once the patient is in a medical setting, be it my office mm -hmm. or the emergency room, and we have more information and we can do another clinical assessment, mm -hmm. uh, then I don't require that the patient be admitted. I've had patients who had potassiums of 7 who come to the emergency room. They get treated. They have chronic kidney disease. We know about it. They're clinically well, and I've let them go home. But I need to treat the potassium before they leave. So the patients would rather, they they'd rather see you than see me because they know they'd end up in the hospital. No, <laughs> not necessarily, but I think that, I think that what, we're, what I'm mm -hmm. hearing is yeah. that based on our training and our patient population, we have a slightly different approach mm -hmm. or different, different cutoffs, uh, and I don't really know what's right or wrong, but I think we're definitely agreeing that we have to individualize and mm -hmm. we really have to focus on the patient. And if there's any concern mm -hmm. about hyperkalemia, treating is right. better than being casual <laughs> about it. But it is true that nephrologists just see hyperkalemia right. every day, all the time. Right. I mean, it's funny because like we mentioned earlier, we're often so much more worried about the low potassiums that almost all of our patients are taking potassium. And then you get to a point where you realize that's probably not helping. I guess that leads into this question about adjusting the medication dose when you see a high potassium. So for me, usually, if I'm seeing a potassium of 5.5, that would be the threshold at which I would start to say, and again, within the clinical context and what the patient's baseline is, that might be the point at which I would say, let's cut down a little bit on the ACE inhibitor and see how they do. Um, with the caveat that we're always trying to get people on the highest dose of ACE inhibitor that they can tolerate because that's what worked in the trials. So as high as you can get is the goal, but I think for many people there's always this threshold that you kind of can't cross because their renal function will worsen, their potassium will worsen. How do you kind of adjust those medications? Well, it's a very big challenge and a quandary for nephrologists because we're very eager mm -hmm. to get our patients on cardioprotective drugs. So now that we've talked about when you would call the patient, um, when you would want to see them in the office, when you would send them into the emergency room, this leads us to the next question, which is how do you manage acute hyperkalemia? Well, this is clearly a important clinical problem. We've already addressed the treatment or prevention of hyperkalemia by treating chronic hyperkalemia. Now the issue is acute hyperkalemia. We both have agreed that the hyperkalemia is of such a magnitude that the patient warrants a visit to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So the treatment is really to prevent further cardiotoxicity. So that's a intravenous calcium infusion, glucose and insulin to um, lower serum potassium, mm -hmm. bicarbonate to shift potassium into cells, and then some more permanent way to get potassium out of the body, be it diuretics, be it resin, be it emergency dialysis. My feeling and my experience is if the patient is making urine, we should be able to manage hyperkalemia of any magnitude medically without hemodialysis. So even if you're seeing EKG changes, you would not move to dialysis first? No. Uh, EKG changes, calcium to stabilize mm -hmm. the myocardium, glucose and insulin to lower the potassium, and then uh, certainly bicarbonate if uh, there's room to give volume, but we want to lower potassium and protect, to uh, protect for toxicity and then remove potassium from the body. So if the patient has end-stage kidney disease, right. doing dialysis is easy. If they have stage four or five chronic kidney disease and don't have a vascular access, it'll take so long to get a vascular right. access and dialysis that there's got to be treatments before that. 
In conclusion, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Goldfinger for her lending her expertise to this forum. I, it was incredibly helpful, and I learned a lot about cardiovascular disease. We are all in agreement that hyperkalemia and chronic kidney disease is a big challenge, especially when we want to use cardioprotective agents. So I hope what we reviewed today is helpful to everybody in their practice. It's important to know that there are several new agents on the horizon, and we may have more drugs coming pretty soon. There are at least two drugs that are under testing, under clinical trials, for the treatment of hyperkalemia. You can search them through the NIH clinical trials website and just use the search term hyperkalemia. In addition, a novel mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist is currently recruiting for a study on protection of diabetic kidney disease, and that's going to be an important trial. So we hope to see more cardioprotective agents and novel treatments for hyperkalemia very soon, so the future looks bright. Thank you again for joining us.